Hi everyone, uh, my name is Arzu and today I'm going to present two papers that are related to each other. The first one has the topic, uh, colorless screen recurrent networks dream hierarchically. The name comes from a sentence which seems to be very famous for linguists, but I hadn't heard of it before. And that one is uh, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. So this sentence is an example of the sentences that are correct uh, grammatically or syntactically, but actually they are not meaningful. So that sentence, uh, colorless screen ideas asleep furiously is syntactically correct, but in terms of semantics, it doesn't mean much. So this paper is, go uh, is doing an ep experiment to see how do neural networks behave when they see this, these types of sentences. And in another word, uh, so the other word that they use is dream which actually comes back to the idea of trying to understand what do neural networks do actually. So inside that black box, what are the actual patterns that the neural networks are detecting? What are the features that they're building? In this paper, the authors uh, trying to understand which patterns do neural networks detect and how do they predict or generate something. So it's not about building a new method or a new architecture of the neural network, but rather the whole experiment is to, is to try to understand what are the patterns that the RNN detects to use them for prediction. The authors have uh, related hierarchical structures of the sentences with their grammatical or syntactical structure. And their experiment is to see what, to what extent do RNNs detect the hierarchical structures that come from the grammar. They have used four languages for their experiment, Italian, English, Hebrew, and Russian. And they have, uh, they check to see whether the RNN can predict uh, long distance number uh, agreements. Number agreement is that, for example, in, in a sentence, the noun is plural, the verb should be plural too, and the same goes for singular. Uh, and long distance means that, for example, the noun and the verb are in the sentence, uh, are in different clauses, and or there are many words between them. Uh, they have also used non-sentences, which are the ones that they are correct syntactically but are not meaningful. Also, uh, only for Italian, they have compared the performance of RNN to humans' intuition and they saw that the performance of RNN in predicting long distance number agreement is comparable with humans. So they have concluded that the RNNs can detect those hierarchies of uh, grammar to a profound extent. So in this presentation, I will talk about an introduction to why this has been a question for people. How did they uh, build the long distance benchmark agreement, uh, what was the setup for their experiment, their baseline models, and what language models they have used. Uh, then I will show some of their results and in what different ways do the models behave for different languages. Some of the work of other people that has done in this topic, and finally a conclusion and what future work can be done in this area. The question that uh, whether the RNNs detect the hierarchical structure has always been important because it was thought that those hierarchies are essential to natural language. And because of this, there has been works that are done in this area. The first one concludes that the RNNs do not detect hierarchies. However, uh, the second one says that they can approximate context-free languages, which are the languages generated by a grammar that has a set of recursive rules that they're used to generate uh, patterns of strings. So this is a sign that they do detect the hierarchies to some extent. Also, since they, they can do syntactic parsing, we can think that um, they detect hierarchies. The last one is the previous work of the one of the authors in which they have evaluated to what extent the RNNs detect uh, hierarchies. So they have tested whether the RNN can learn to predict English subject verb agreements, which is a task requires the information from a hierarchical structure. Uh, this work actually builds and builds on and confirms the previous work. 
Uh, they built their uh, test set by adding some not sentences to the original sentences. So they extract the original sentences from a tree bank, which looks like this. And um, they have built some non sentences using the original ones. Uh, they have substituted all of the context words with uh, random words, but with the same morphology. For example, if they're plural or singular. So the sentences would be syntactically correct, but it wouldn't have a meaning. Uh, then using a language model, they have tried to predict the part of speech for uh, the second word in the, trans in the dependency. One of the primary examples of uh, agreements is the subject verb agreement in English. But in this paper, they have also considered other types of agreements too. Um, the two words that have to agree on some syntactic features are uh, girl and thinks. So the first one is called the queue, and the second one is called the target. Using language models, we should be able to predict the target from the queue. Um, so why is the long distance agreement a good candidate to see if RNN detects the structure? For the case of local agreements, for example, the first one, uh, the girl thinks. So this is not a good example to check if RNN is detecting the hierarchical structure. The RNN can predict the next one correctly because it has seen them together many times. It is not because of detecting the hierarchy. But the next one, or maybe like the last one, um, that is an example that, so this example is more difficult to predict because it hasn't, the model hasn't seen them together many times. It has to detect the structural relation between the subject and the verb. So it is a good candidate to see if the RNN detects the structure or not. So which constructions did they exactly choose? Uh, first, uh, they collected pairs of part of speech tags that are connected by a dependency arc. So this is a dependency arc. And so again, the first one is the queue, and the second one is the target. And anything between them is called the context. Here, uh, verb adverb is the context. And they call the whole part of a speech sequence a construction. Here, uh, noun verb adverb verb is a construction. For each pair, they collected all of the contexts that in the purpose appeared between the queue and target. So for example, uh, the girl, the boys like often goes. And another context uh, for this can be the girl in the class goes or the, gir the girl in the cafe goes. Here are some of the examples of other languages. Also, since they're focusing on long distance agreement, they only collect collected the constructions that the context had at least three tokens. But they excluded the constructions that the target and queue didn't need to agree on numbers. For example, uh, for English, they kept the subject verb construction, but they excluded the verb object construction because they don't need to agree on numbers. So they didn't list which constructions they picked for all of the four languages, uh, except for Italian, but they mentioned that it was between two and 21. And here are the constructions that they included for all of the four languages. And these are the ones for Italian. Uh, they had two types of sentences uh, in their test set the original sentences and the non sentences. The original sentences included the queue, the context, and the target. And they made sure that for each target, uh, there are sentences with both singular and plural forms of the word. Because later, they want to calculate the probability that the target is plural or singular. And uh, so the average number of context words between uh, queue and target was, was between 3.6 for Hebrew and 4.5 for Italian. Also, they generated some non sentences for each original sentence. And so they have nine versions of the same sentence with which is nonsensical. So it has the exact same part of speech sequence, but the words were substituted with another random context word. 
here, um, the first one is a original sentence, which has the meaning, and the next one is a non-sentence, which has been generated from the first one. So there are some forms that can appear with uh, different part of speeches, for example, plural nouns and singular verbs in English. They have excluded some of them, and they have excluded the words that appear with a different part of speech more than 10% of the time in the tree bank. For evaluation uh, of the, each of the sentences in the test set, they give the model a sentence with prefix P, up to and excluding the target, and the model predicts the probability that it is plural or singular. They show T1 as the singular form of the target, and T2 as the plural form of the target. And they take the one that had the higher probability as the predicted form of the target. Uh, now I talk about the setup for their experiment. For this data, they extracted the tree banks from the universal dependency tree bank. English and Hebrew have been post-processed to obtain a richer morphological annotation at the word level. For training sets of English, Italian, and Russian, they extracted the corpora from Wikipedias, tokenized them, filtered the sentences with more than 5% unknown words. For Hebrew, again, it was Wikipedia corpus, but this uh, person had already collected them from Wikipedia, had done the pre-processing, so they just used that data set. They extracted 90 million tokens for each language, shuffled them, divided them into training and test sets with ratio 8 to 1. They only included the uh, 50,000 most frequent words and replaced the others with U and K, which stands for unknown, and they were excluded from the when they calculated the perplexity. They have done uh, their experiment with uh, both with simple RNN and LSTM models. Their models uh, have two hidden layers with 650 and 20 neurons in each layer. Um, also, they have experimented with a different ranges of batch sizes, learning rates, and dropout rates. In general, what they uh, realized was that the more neurons in the hidden layers, the lower the perplexity, and they get a better performance. Because they realized that the LSTM is better, they didn't even show the results for RNNs, they just showed uh, the results for LSTM, and it makes sense, right, because the simple RNN has vanishing gradient issues and forgets the information of the past, and LSTM doesn't have that problem, so that's probably why it works better. Uh, for the baseline model, they, they have used a Unigram model, and so in this case, it picks the most frequent form of the target word, whether it is singular or plural. And the next baseline model is a five gram model, which has been smoothed using this KN method. And the last one is a five gram LSTM for which the LSTM can only see a window of five tokens. They have compared the KN model with the five gram LSTM and they said that the uh, five gram LSTM can generalize better to the things that it has not seen before because it gets information through the recurrent connections and its embedding layers. But since it can only see five tokens, it is not suitable for detecting long distance dependencies.